Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV, the place for stories of awesome faith overcoming impossible odds. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for September 4, How to Destroy Your Enemies. Please join me in a call to worship. If the Lord had not been on our side, let all God's people say, if the Lord had not been on our side, we would have been swept away by the storm. When our enemies surrounded us, we would have fallen. Lord, there is no friend like you. Keep your loving arms around us and shelter us with your everlasting arms. Amen. The responsive reading is from Ecclesiastes 12. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. The words of the wise are like goads, like firmly embedded nails. They are given by the one true shepherd. Now that all has been heard, here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the purpose of all people. Our gospel lesson is from Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, love your enemy. Our gospel lesson is from Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect in love, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect in love. The sermon text is from Acts chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed round him. He fell to the ground and heard a loud voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to, uh, to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. 
Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. The Damascus Road conversion of the Apostle Paul is one of the most important events of the Bible. He would probably have been horrified to think that his letters would one day become our scriptures. But those who read them heard in them the voice of God. They were the earliest of all our Christian scriptures, and more than one quarter of the New Testament bears his name today. This is a strange conversion account. Nobody was there to preach a sermon. He wasn't anywhere near a church. There was no evangelist calling him to come forward and give his heart to Christ. Jesus didn't even ask him to turn his life around. The Lord just knocked him off his high horse, blinded him, and shouted at him. But God knew something about Paul that he didn't realize about himself. The King James Version gives us a hint. It says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. <laughs> the pricks, or the goads, were cattle prods. They were used to herd cattle or guide oxen as they plowed. But the Bible uses them as a metaphor for the human conscience. We human critters can reason our way around most anything, convincing ourselves that we're doing the right thing, even when we know it's wrong. But those pangs of conscience hurt more and more until they become hard to ignore. We met Saul a couple of chapters ago cheering on the murderous mob that was stoning St. Stephen. We know Paul was small of stature. He probably was too small to throw any heavy rocks. So he contented himself with holding the cloaks of those who did. Stephen's prayer of forgiveness was the first pinprick in the conscience of Saul. Now, it's a curious thing when we convince ourselves that our hateful or hurtful actions are good, and someone points out that we're in the wrong, our natural reaction is anger. That's what happened to Paul. He knew he was doing wrong, so he just doubled down on it and did it louder. Jesus knew that Paul's conscience was hurting him, and he knew the cattle prod was pricking his heart. And Paul was shouting so loud and so long, he scarcely realized it himself. But there was another conversion in this story that was just as important. Ananias thought Paul was a heartless monster. He saw him as the enemy, and he had good reason to think so. Jesus told Ananias that Paul was suffering, and you don't have to read too hard between the lines to hear him say, well, good. Paul deserves to suffer for what he did. Let him rot in hell for all I care. He deserves it. I hear what you're saying, Lord, and I'm telling you, I don't want to do it. Send somebody else or send Paul where he deserves to go, but Lord, please don't make me go and pray for Saul. But if Ananias hadn't gone to Paul, his eyes would never have been opened. His conversion would never have been complete. 
he would never have let the world know that Jesus is Lord. Jesus had to convert Ananias into thinking that the best way to destroy that enemy was to make him into a friend. Paul never heard a sermon, but if I was Ananias, I would have been rehearsing a good one every step of the way. I'd have been ready to blister Paul the moment I laid eyes on him. But when he stepped through the door, the first word Ananias spoke was, Brother, Brother Saul, I've come to lay hands on you, to touch you in Jesus' name, and pray for your healing, body and soul. He touched that miserable creature, and all heaven erupted with joy, for in that moment, Ananias' conversion was complete, and so was Paul's. Those two enemies destroyed each other as they became two friends. Of course, that's a nice Bible story, isn't it? But no one expects that to happen today. Not in this world where battle lines and conspiracy theories are being drawn. Everyone is shouting at everyone else and everyone is trying to convince themselves that they are doing the right thing by shouting at their enemies. There is no way the pinpricks of conscience can stem a tide like that. Is there? Well, let me tell you about Daryl Davis, the man whose photo was on the front of this video. Mr. Davis is a hero of mine. Over the past 40 years, he's been attending Ku Klux Klan gatherings, getting to know Klan members. And because of his work, over 200 Klansmen have left the group and given their robes and hoods to Daryl. How can a black man accomplish all of those conversions? Well, first of all, He's a musician. He uses music to reach people because it's a universal language. Then he does something really crazy. He shares a meal and gets to know his sworn enemies. He said, I started out by learning all I could about the Klan, its history, its organization, its goals, and its reasons and I showed them I respected them enough to get to know them. I didn't argue with them or belittle them. I just got to know them and learn their personal stories. You know, it turned out that most Klan members had never really talked to a black man. None of them had ever been to dinner at a black man's house. He said in time they realized they couldn't know me as a friend and hate me as a man. So in that way, Daryl Davis has destroyed hundreds of his enemies by making them into his friends. He showed them respect, something most of them really craved. You remember we talked about respect a couple of weeks ago? Respect is an awful lot like love. The best way to get it is to give a lot of it away. Without even realizing it, as he respected them, his enemies came to respect him and their conscience pricked them because it's hard to hold respect and hate in the same heart. Today, our endless news cycle is teaching us to shout at many enemies. It's become impossible to be for anything without being against someone else, without being against lots of folks who don't see the world exactly as you do. So 
I recommend that you make a list, a long list of all your enemies and then start destroying them. Learn about them. Listen to their stories. Respect them and make them into your friends. Then when they ask you why, you can tell them about Jesus and his servant, Daryl Davis, and then your conversion will be complete.